This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Well, I left you at the end of the previous session there to have a go at what you see in front of you here, example two, which hopefully you've both performed and reviewed. But very quickly, what we've been asked to do is to work out just the property income assessment here for our tax year 1819. So we need the rental income received less the allowable expenses paid during the tax year. So we're told that out an annual rent of £9,600. So whereas with previous example, where it was only let out part way through the tax year, we've got a full year's worth of rent that should have come in here, uh, payable monthly in advance. So we'd expect to see the entire 9,600. But of course, what transpires down the bottom here is that uh, we had a tenant in through, uh, from the start of the uh, tax year, 1819, but uh, basically during June 2018, did a runner, as they say there, left the property without having paid the rent due. Sid was unable to trace the defaulting tenant, so that money never came in, but we did manage to let the property from the next month, from the 1st of July. So rather than having 12 months worth of rental, we've only got 11 months worth of rental. So of that 9,600, just 11 twelfths would equal the amount received there. Having got the rental income received, what about the allowable expenses paid? Well, we've got payments here. Here's the pay date. May 18, well, that's in the tax year. But look what it is, construction of a garage replacing the carport. That's an improvement. A carport is just a cover across the side of the house there. Construction of a garage. So in which case, that is improvement. That is capital expenditure. That is not allowable revenue. But when the property is sold, of course, that's when, in addition to any other capital costs incurred in acquiring and improving that property, you can also deduct from the proceeds the £2,000 construction cost of the garage. But it's not a revenue, it's a capital expense, so we don't deduct it here. Insurance for the year, paid June 18, £480. Again, we've given you information there about what it was for the previous year through to the 30th of June of 18. It doesn't matter. We don't use now an accruals basis as what you would have used back in 1718. It's what you'd still use if, of course, the taxpayer elected to have the accruals basis in use. But unless you told that, which you probably won't be, then you've got to work on a, on a paid and received basis for cash, a cash basis. So there's the amount paid, 480, June 18. So that one, allowable. Come back to the January 19 one in a moment. Uh, May 19 there. Uh, oh, sorry, got November 18. I'm skipping one there. November 18, drain clearance. Yeah, paid in November 18. That's a perfectly allowable revenue repair expense and therefore is allowable. Again, I'll come back to that one in a moment. It's the trickier one. But this one, without even looking at what it was, May 2019, that's to be dealt with in the 1920 tax year, whereas redecoration work, it will of course be an allowable expense. It doesn't matter now when the work happened to have been completed, we're not using the accruals basis, we're using the cash basis. So that then for will not be deductible. We bought this new cooker with integrated microwave oven, you'll be pleased to hear, replacing a cooker, so that's not the same product, sold for £50. So off the old cooker, for which there'd have been the original one, if it were the original, there'd be no allowability as regards that initial cost. But we do get now replacement furniture relief. A replacement cooker, rather than this uh, integrated cooker and microwave here, a replacement cooker, a like for like, that would have cost £300. So that's the basis of the allowable cost. But what do we reduce it by? Any amount received on the old item there, the old cooker. So we've got 300 minus 50, that'll be £250. So you put those expenses paid together, deduct them from the property income received, and all being well, you came out with an answer that looked something like that one. In fact, exactly like that one, I would have hoped there. So again, hopefully all okay with that. Back to the notes and on to pastures new. Uh, 
what we've assumed at the moment, of course, is that any rental income received will be bigger than the allowable expenses paid. And in most situations that you'll see in the exam, that will be the case. But of course, you might have a year where you incur rather more expenses than you'd anticipated and may have rather less rental income than you would have wanted. In which case, it may end up that the expenses outweigh the rental income and therefore you incur a loss. Or whenever we make losses, you don't put a bracketed, a negative figure into your income tax computation. Instead, there is nothing to assess, but there is a loss. If they, they, HMRC, if they are going to assess us on profits when rental income is bigger than expenses, when it's the other way around and expenses are bigger than income, then they've got to give us relief for the losses sustained. It's a very simple rule. But if our total expenses do indeed exceed rental income, so we've made a loss, the property income assessment is nil, and that excess property loss is carried forward. Only one thing you can do with it, carry it forward, and what will you set it off against in future tax years? Future property income profits only. Can't go against any other source of income. It will simply go forward against future property income there. What you might have an exam question is, you've got rental income received, less allowable expenses paid this year, and you've got a net property income assessment. They also tell you that brought forward at the start of the tax year was a brought forward property income loss. That will then be set off against whatever is this year's assessment. In working out whether or not we had a profit or a loss, a major expense item we said for most people renting out property will not have absolute ownership of that property. In most cases, they will have taken out a mortgage. They'll have taken out a buy to let mortgage in order to finance the purchase of the property. And up until and including the 2016-17 tax year, any such finance expenses that they incurred were allowable expenses against the property income. So it would reduce the property income assessment to then include upon the income tax computation. The figure assessable for property income would have been made lower by the full amount of the finance expense incurred. But they changed then from 1718 the tax treatment of that finance expense. And what we're told about here is what we now do. From 2017-18, fundamental change for residential property. Commercial property is unaffected by these rules. As to how tax relief is achieved for such finance expenses incurred in a tax year. So that back in 17-18, only 75% of the expense was deductible and the remaining 25% falling in again, sorry, falling then in 25 percentage points to 0% in 2021. I'll tell you what happens to the other 25% in a moment. But whereas in 1617, 100% of the finance expense that you incurred was an allowable deduction, in 1718, it was only 75% and falling in 25 percentage points from one tax year to another, it's going to be therefore 0% from 2021, but in 1819, it's now 50% of the finance costs will be allowed as an expense deduction against the rental income. Now clearly what that means is that the property income assessment is bigger as a result. Now you might think, well, that's not fair. Well, fair doesn't necessarily have anything to do with taxation, remember here. Don't use the F word fair when talking in terms of taxation. But what has happened is that the amount that is not deductible is not lost from relief. It's not lost from the taxation system. But they've defined a very different way by which tax relief will be given for that other 1819 tax year, that remaining that other 50% of that finance expense. And it will now achieve tax relief for the taxpayer not as an expense, but as a tax reduction. We'll call it interest relief. It will show as a tax reduction in computing the tax liability of the taxpayer. 
The relief, however, will only be given at the basic rate of 20%. So what's going to happen is, instead of allowing all of the finance expense as an expense figure in the 1819 tax year, only half of it will be allowed as a deduction against income. The remaining half at 20% basic rate of income tax will then be a tax credit to be deducted after calculating tax at basic rate, higher rate, additional rate, whatever you might be there. You'll then take away this interest relief, this tax reduction, this tax reducer that will be that remaining 50% of the finance expense at 20% basic rate relief. You might say, what difference does that make? Why does it matter? We'll explain that in just a few minutes time. It says, this change will therefore have no overall effect on the tax liability of a basic rate taxpayer, but will increase the tax liability of a higher rate or additional rate taxpayer. Now again, we'll explain that. But what's going to happen therefore as an example in 1819, if you were told that you'd incurred your mortgage interest, that mortgage, your loan on a property, mortgage interest expense of £4,000 was paid. In 1819, only 50%, £2,000 of that will be shown as an allowable expense to set against the property income received. That will reduce your property income by 2000 rather than £4,000. The remaining 50% of that expense, £2,000, will then achieve tax relief as a tax reduction at the basic rate of 20%. So that will reduce the tax liability by, well, 2000 at 20% is 400 So having calculated, doing your normal tax calculation on your normal taxable income, non-saving, savings, dividend, basic rate, higher rate, additional rate. Having got that figure of tax, using the property income assessment where we've only allowed 50% of the finance expense, having got that assessment, got that tax, before you then denote that total as tax liability, you take a deduction out. Here that deduction, £400. It means that if you are a higher or additional rate taxpayer, you're only now going to get relief in this way at 20% instead of at 40% or 45% if you are a higher rate or an additional rate taxpayer. Now we'll illustrate and explain that particular point. Well, we're back to the present day now and we're looking at the Finance Act 2019 material. I thought I'd re-record this particular example because it's got just our only basic issues as mentioned in our original introduction to Chapter 3 but about things like the personal allowance and the basic rate ban. So easy for me to re-record this and then to go back to the uh, cons uh, consistent material, which is then from Section 4, Furnished Holiday Lettings onwards. And again, you can then use the Finance Act 18 material. So let's have a look at what Example 3 is asking us to do. Now, of course, actually dealing with it, as you'd have to for your exam, computing the 2019-20 income tax liability. So we're not just talking about a single issue, a property income assessment, though that will be fundamental here. It's about then integrating that property income assessment into your overall income tax computation. And this issue about dealing with finance expenses, it's got to go to an income tax calculation because calculating the property income assessment is only half the story. As we have seen, Although you've just listened to the 50-50 split for 1819, it's now a 25-75% split for 1920, as hopefully you recall from the introduction to uh, this chapter in the first lecture. But what we see is that only 25% of any interest expense is going to be allowed as a deduction. The compensation for the restriction in that uh, expense deduction is in the form of a tax credit. And that tax credit only comes in in computing tax liability. So any such question dealing here with these finance expenses has got to cover both issues. It must initially ask you to determine the property income assessment and then move on 
to calculate the tax liability, because only then do you see the second part of the process, the deduction of the basic rate tax credit. So let's see what we've got here, therefore, in example three. First of all, our hero, or heroine as the expression might be, Dora House Blesser. She has employment income of £60,000. Immediate thoughts there for 1920 is that she's going to be a higher rate tax payer. And has also got rental income received. Now, of course, in the exam question, you may have to work that figure out for yourself given the dates when the rental income was uh, due to be received, when it was actually received, which is what we're interested in. And of course, uh, they're putting all of that together for the tax year 1920. Here, it's just given to you. But we've done previous examples where you've had to work that figure out for yourself. So that's £10,000. And of course, there are expenses. So she paid, again, we're working on a cash basis, maintenance expenditure. Yeah, well, that's a normal routine allowable expense. And that was £800. And then we've got mortgage interest charges, our finance expense of £6,000. Now, what you know is that that £6,000 must be divided in terms of how it will achieve tax relief for the taxpayer. Only 25% of that, so... 6,000 at 25%, well, I think equal 1,500. Only 1,500 of it will, for the 1920 tax year, be allowed as an expense. So that's your expense figure. It will mean that the other £4,500 of that interest payment will only be dealt with in the calculation of the tax liability and we will get a credit in deriving that tax liability, a deduction there in deriving that tax liability, measured at 20% of the other 75% of the £6,000 finance expense. So that, therefore, well, that should be a tax credit of £900. So what I need you to do now, which you should be perfectly capable of doing, I need you to put the income tax computation together down to taxable income and then do your basic calculation of tax liability i.e how much basic rate taxable income how much if any there will be some here as we know higher rate taxable income taxed at your 20 percent and 40 percent and then to deduct from that figure of tax well there you go we know the figure a tax credit of 900 in deriving then the tax liability so I'd like you to tackle that. Now you see what we've got? Employment income, 60,000, non-savings income. Property income, you're gonna work that out in a separate working for yourself. We know the received, and we know what expenses will be allowable as expenses in deriving the property income assessment. Get the property income assessment, put it on your income tax computation. That, again, is non-savings income. Put the two together, non-savings, the combination of employment and property there, of course, and get total income. Take away for us our 1920 personal allowance, that being £12,500, of course. Get your taxable income. That figure of taxable income will be greater than the basic rate band limit. So, do your basic rate band at 20% up to that limit, the excess at 40%, take away, as we keep saying, this tax credit here of £900, get the income tax liability. So pause for a moment there while you do those calculations, and then join us back again, hopefully in just a few minutes' time, and I'll review that answer with you. Okay, looking at that answer now, hopefully no surprises here. As given the rental income received and the maintenance costs paid. As we computed the amount of mortgage interest finance expense allowable, just 25% of the expense figure, that was 1500 That gives us, therefore, a property income assessment of what appears to be £7,700. Put that together in your calculation of your income tax liability, your income tax computation, we have employment income and, of course, the property income figure. 
total income, take away your personal allowance, we have taxable income. Very clearly, a figure that is in excess of £37,500. It's all non-saving, so I haven't bothered with any additional colum columns there, i.e. both a non-savings and a total, which would be exactly the same. Calculate the basic rate tax on the 37500 the excess will then be taxable at 40%. And although that would otherwise have been the tax liability, it isn't at the moment. Because we get this interest relief, this tax credit coming in, we know what it is, the other 75% of the 6,000, i.e. 4,500, taken at basic rate. That, as we deduced, was a tax credit of 900, and that will give you the income tax liability. Remember, yes, we had employment income. Uh, I could have shown in the question the amount of PAYE, the pay as you earn, the income tax deducted at source on that employment income. That, of course, would not be accounted for here in deriving income tax liability. Any PAYE that you have already suffered at source, that would be deducted from the tax liability in, of course, deriving tax payable. Again, just a few notes here. As we said, I haven't bothered on this in terms of uh, a separate analysis. We've got non-savings. It is a total income. We don't need both. As we've seen, Dora is a higher rate taxpayer. That, that's going to be not that you need to uh, compute this unless it was asked for, which I better much doubt it would be. But it's effectively an additional tax charge of £900 as a result of the disallowance of the interest expense and then instead the substitution for 75% of that expense anyway in the form of a tax credit. The property income assessment is higher by £4,500. We've only allowed a mortgage interest deduction of £1,500 instead of, of £6,000, a difference of four and a half. So as a result of, as we said, disallowing 75% of the mortgage interest. So that increases the taxable income by that self same figure of four and a half thousand that would then be taxed at 40 percent thus increasing tax of interest uh, again which increases the tax of income which is taxed at 40 percent by the same four thousand five hundred thus increasing the tax charge by 1800 40 percent of four thousand five hundred and what have we then done we've deducted interest relief of 900 so the difference between 1800 and 900, the change in the taxation treatment since 1718 has resulted, therefore, in an extra £900 of tax being paid. If, as we know, Dora had only been a basic rate taxpayer, then although we must still follow the process through on our computation, we must identify the different treatment of the amount of finance expense that is still allowable as a deduction against income and we still acknowledge the 20% tax credit there'll actually be no difference in terms of the taxation outcome because if she was only a basic rate taxpayer her additional taxable income of four and a half thousand that would in be still be the basic rate band so taxed at 20% that would be 900 so increasing the tax charge by just 900 pounds which would then be eliminated by the tax reduction of £900. So we've reduced the expense, we've increased the tax charge by £900, we've got a tax credit of £900, we are back to square one. In 2021, of course, that uh, means that none of the expense, the current £6,000, would be allowable as a deduction against income. So all of the £6,000 mortgage interest would be given as this tax reducer, this tax credit. And that means that effectively, since 1718, the tax charge is going to increase by 6,040%, 2,400, as a higher rate taxpayer. And the compensation, 6,020% is the tax credit, £1,200. So you can see an increasing tax liability of £1,200 there. If just to finish off this issue, I take you back to the notes. Uh, again, as we say, as we've just seen, as stated earlier in this section, the new rules apply only to residential property. 
but does not include a term that uh, you're not yet familiar with, furnished holiday lettings that we see here. That's the next area we go to where there are some uh, preference, uh, uh, preferential, I should say, uh, treatment of furnished holiday lettings, as we'll discuss in a few moments time. These rules are only applicable to individuals. This is an income tax issue and not to companies. So the company owned properties and we're letting them out, as we see here, there's no restriction as regards the tax deductibility within the corporate tax computation of that finance expense. How and where it is deducted, that's an issue to deal with in corporation tax. But it is an allowable deduction in terms of establishing the overall, as we'll come to know it, taxable total profit of the company. Now, because therefore companies are not impacted by these changes in the allowability of finance expense, such that here higher and additional rate taxpayers with a highly geared, i.e. we know what gearing is, high debt, highly geared, high debt, residential property portfolio may well consider incorporating their property businesses to maintain the tax relief for finance expense. As a higher rate taxpayer, here we can see that by, well, by the time you listen to this, it may be the 2021 tax year, but by, in our syllabus terms, the next tax year, 2021, none of the expense will be allowable deduction. All of it will be a tax credit. Therefore, you're going to suffer a 40% tax charge in relation to the income and only get back a 20% tax credit. What happens, of course, in terms of corporation tax is that all of that expense will be an allowable deduction, and then it will only suffer tax at the corporate tax rate, which you'll find, in fact, is a slightly lower rate than the basic rate of income tax. That is only 19%. So there, a potential discursive issue for you to come up with a suggestion. If you are dealing with a higher or additional rate taxpayer, where the situation would be even worse, who has got a highly geared property portfolio, now moving to a situation where none of that expense will be allowable from 2021, it may be, indeed in reality, in practice, it has been a consideration about whether or not that individual should incorporate their property business by basically transferring the ownership of the properties into a company so it then becomes corporate income, and corporate income will then allow a full deduction of any finance expense in deriving the taxable total profit for the company, and on that basis, a tax saving will be achieved. Details of the finance cost restriction will be given in the tax rates and allowances section of the exam. If you look back to, again, which you probably have with you, your rates and allowances page, you will see that what we have seen here in terms of the 25-75% split for 19-20, that information is provided to you. Okay, um, we've interrupted there, of course, the series of lectures from last year. We'll now return to that because, again, other than this particular issue on finance expense and other than it's last year's, it's a year older, now is a year younger, and other than having maybe if you only if you've got to do an income tax computation, dealing with the new personal allowance in the income tax comp and uh, the new basic rate tax ban, everything else is the same. So there'll be no further differences so far as you are concerned. OK, I'll leave it back to you now, therefore, and back to me indeed uh, for last year's Finance Act 18 discussion of furnished holiday lettings and thereafter the remainder of this chapter. Okay, well, a bit of a learning exercise now, which you'll probably actually defer to later in your studies, in all honesty. But it's about this section called furnished holiday lettings. Now, we're used to the idea of property income being assessed on a received basis. Rental received, less allowable expenses paid. We've seen specific issues there, and probably the most examinable part of all of this, as regards the allowability and tax treatment of finance expenses. Those particular types of assessments and issues that we have seen have dealt with your normal property whereby you're letting it out for a period of time, usually an extended period of time, months if not years there, to a particular tenant. 
but there has now been brought in, in sort of more recent years, rules that pertain to a very special type of property income. And that's, as you see here, furnished holiday lettings. So the idea now is, rather than having one tenant in there for an extended period of time, we're going to see, as you would with a holiday, short-term lets, maybe at max two weeks, three weeks, something like that, often just a matter of days. We're getting into the Airbnb territory here, aren't we? So in terms of these furnished holiday lettings, there is some preferential and some not so preferential tax treatment that happens. If you are providing this service of a furnished holiday let, there's rather more work for you to do. You don't just sign a lease agreement with a tenant for 12 months and then just watch the money come in and go around and check the property every now and again to make sure that it's OK, that they haven't wrecked the place indeed there. Now, you might have uh, again these uh, tenants, in inverted commas, coming in for two or three nights. Every time new tenants come in, go out, you've got to go in, do work. You've got to clean the property up, prepare it for the next guests to come in there. And what that is doing is taking on rather more the idea of a trade. We talk about property business income. And what we've got here, therefore, these special rules that now apply, not hugely different, by the way. The letting is treated as if it were a trade. This means, though, again, we're going to tax it as income, property income from a UK property business. Some of the provisions which apply to actual trades your normal trading issues that you'll see in the next chapter and beyond dealing with trading profits. Some of the things that we see there will also apply now, but purely for this type of rental property, furnished holiday lettings. OK, what are they? Now, we haven't dealt with these yet, so it's, again, not something you to worry about, just an awareness at this stage. You'll come back to what are these learning exercises like this, it's a list of rules that have to be learnt and maybe regurgitated in the exam there or on an objective testing question identified in an exam there. Um, it's not a doing exercise as such. We've still got exactly the same issues to deal with. What's the rental income received? What are the allowable expenses paid out? All of that is the same. But what we've also got here is that in relation to furniture and furnishings, where we had normal furnished lettings, of course, we had that replacement furniture relief. But now we don't have that. What we have here is capital allowances. Now, capital allowances, we have a very big chapter. That's a really important chapter, chapter five, coming up after we've been introduced to trades and trading income in chapter four. And what it does is represent the way in which HMRC give taxation relief to capital expenditure incurred there on what they would refer to in Chapter 5 as qualifying plant and machinery. And what happens is that the furniture here is looked upon as that in the context of this furnished holiday letting trade as plant and machinery. Therefore, we get capital allowances. Now, what that does is to define when you buy plant and machinery, what tax relief do you get? Well, what we'll discover in Chapter 5 when we come to it is that basically, and certainly here in this context, when you buy furniture and furnishings for the furnished holiday let, you will get a capital allowance, which will basically give you 100% tax relief in the tax year in which you incur that expenditure. So that, therefore, is going to give immediate and full relief for the capital expenditure against your income. That, as I say, is dealt with in Chapter 5. In Chapter 10, we see pensions. Now, we've seen stuff already, a little bit anyway, to do with pensions, most specifically personal pension contributions. And we've seen how it is that tax relief is achieved, not through presentation of a personal pension contribution as a deduction on the income tax computation in deriving taxable income, because we don't. It is not deducted there. Instead, we saw how we got basic rate relief at source. You put paid £8,000 in the tax year into your pension fund, and you got credited with £10,000. Your £8,000 plus £2,000 of tax that have been suffered by you 
paid over to HMRC, paid back by HMRC into your pension fund. And then if you were a higher rate or moving even higher to additional rate, you got the extra relief there by extension of the higher rate bands, extension of the additional rate band by the gross amount of that personal pension contribution. So tax relief was received in that way. So clearly anything that gives you tax relief is very good news. But it's not carte blanche, as you'll discover in terms of Chapter 10, for you to just put any amount of payments into your pension fund and gain tax relief. There are limitations, there are caps placed upon how much pension contribution in any one tax year will achieve tax relief. And the first such limitation that you'll see when we come to Chapter 10, don't worry now, is about your relevant earnings. And relevant earnings will be the basis of allowability in relation to the amount of pension contribution you put in. And your relevant earnings are basically your earned income, employment income, or as we've started to refer to here, trading income. Well, in addition to those two, if you've got profits from furnished holiday lettings, then that too, that net income, that will also rank as being relevant earnings, allowing you there the capacity at least to make, make bigger contributions into your pension fund and, as we wish to, achieve tax relief thereof. The final one here is capital gains tax. Now then, we don't yet know about capital gains tax other than a very simple concept. We buy a capital asset. Some years later, we sell that asset for more than the total costs we incurred in acquiring it there. And the profit made is a capital gain. And that capital gain is subject to its own taxation, capital gains tax. But there are certain reliefs that exist as regards certain assets when they are sold. And that's going to be a very important area. We'll see it indeed in Chapter 14, where we get the main reliefs coming through. So capital gains tax. Reliefs, and obviously any relief available to a taxpayer that might diminish the gain in any way that would otherwise be immediately taxable is good news for the taxpayer. So again, it's a plus point. So capital gains tax, rollover relief, gift relief and entrepreneur's relief. Now, there's a handful in terms of reliefs there. Hugely important to us in the context of the syllabus, but that awaits us in Chapter 14. But again, a normal property when sold a rental property, your normal, just basic furnished or unfurnished property there, that when that is sold, any capital gain will be fully taxable. What we'll have here is when a furnished holiday netting property is sold, then reliefs may be available. And those reliefs may allow you to defer the gain or indeed diminish the amount of tax charge that is going to be levied thereon by applying a lower tax rate. All of this will make sense after Chapter 14. But again, it's good news. So that's the plus side there. Now, the profit or loss computed for tax years, again, on the cash basis, but a bit of a problem now as regards losses. Losses may only be carried forward against future profits from furnished holiday lettings. So we've got to keep as our property income this bit separate from the other property income because if there is a loss made in relation to your furnished holiday letting you can't offset that against profits made on other just normal lettings there so what we do with it is to carry it forward and it's got this restricted use only against future profits from furnished holiday lets that is obviously a restriction in terms of allowing you relief for that loss Anything that restricts your access to the use of a loss is bad news. So that's the downside of this. Overall, on balance, obviously, when you go into such a furnished holiday letting business, you hope you're not going to make losses. So hopefully that is a moot point there. So there are definite advantages to be gained. And that's why in the next bit, not something for you to worry about now, but rather closer to the exam because this is not a doing exercise, it's a learning exercise. With the best one in the world, you learn it now, 
We're going to fill your heads with a whole lot more doing stuff in the chapters to come. Give it a week, give it two weeks, certainly give it the time from now to your exam. You're probably going to forget that. So in which case, be aware of it now and you learn the rules, the detailed rules. Just like with the admin, you'll be aware of it sooner, but you're only going to learn it later, i.e. closer to exam date. So the lettings, first of all, restrictions as to where they are. UK or European Economic Area, basically the EU plus three other countries, they're going to tell you if it's an overseas country, whether that is indeed European Economic Area. Furnished accommodation, obviously, made on a commercial basis. Lettings on a commercial basis with a view to the realisation of profit. That's why you're doing this. Here's the specific conditions. Now, as I say, is what you'll be learning at a later point in time. To qualify for the sort of benefits that we uh, itemise there, these are conditions. The accommodation must be available to let for at least 210 days in the tax year. Again, this is supposed to be on a commercial basis with a view to realisation of profits. So that therefore means it can't be just your holiday home that you decide to let out for a few weeks a year. It's got to be available to let for at least 210 days. The accommodation then must actually be let for at least half of that 105 days there. So there's the first two conditions. And we've said it's furnished holiday lets. Holidays, sadly, are relatively short periods of time. I wish they were longer. And again, with this, with stuff like Airbnb, it might be a few nights, it might be a week, might be two, maybe max three weeks. What it isn't is someone living in that property for a very extended period of time, like when you normally let properties on leases of, say, six or 12 months or maybe even longer. So here the final rule. No one individual person occupies the property for more than 31 consecutive days. If one or more persons do or does occupy the property, for more than 31 consecutive days, then if that happens, again, a one individual person in that property for more than 31 consecutive days, then the number of times that's happened with different individuals during the year, these periods of long letting, long letting must not exceed 155 days in the year. So there's a limitation placed there on. OK, not to be learnt now, but to be learnt closer to exam date. A bit more interesting in terms of we can do some calculations on this. Up until this point in time, we've made an assumption. And that is that the property being let out is not the property that you live in. It's a separate property bought with a purpose of letting there. That's why you bought it. Not to live in it, but to let it out. To basically run it as a property business and hopefully make a profit thereon. But what happens now is we see that maybe individuals let out a room or rooms within their own property, the one that they, they live in, their private main residence. And because of that, there are special, more beneficial rules that will apply in this circumstance. So if an individual lets out a room or rooms, obviously furnished in his or her main residence, again, of course, as living accommodation, then gross rents up to £7,500 per annum are exempt. And this exemption is known as rent-a-room relief. Now, that's not bad, is it? But if you are willing to take in what we call a lodger there, someone to come and live in your house, uh, with you in your property, they've got their own rooms, access to various other rooms, whatever. But if they rent out a room or rooms in your property, then you could have gross rental income of up to £7,500 a year, and that would be exempt. Any profit made thereon would be exempted. Not bad. The exemption may be ignored. Now you think, 
why would the taxpayer want to exempt, uh, to ignore an exemption? Surely exemptions are good news. Well, not always. The exemption may be ignored if the taxpayer wants to generate a loss where expenses exceed income. The idea of exemptions, and we'll see more of these as we go through, is an exemption is great where it exempts what would have been a profit or what would have been a capital gain. Something that removes chargeability to tax as an exemption is clearly good news. But if they're going to exempt profits and gains, it means equally we're going to exempt losses. So if you make a loss and that is exempt, then you're going to get no relief for that loss. Therefore, again, generosity on part of HMRC, they are allowing you here to ignore this exemption. You can elect to ignore that election. And why would you do it? Basically, where expenses exceed income or where your actual expenses exceed seven and a half thousand pounds. What we've done here with rent a room relief is just to say gross rents up to seven and a half thousand pounds per annum there are exempt. Go over that, we're talking about it being taxable. So what happens? If you go down the rent a room route, then if gross rents exceed seven and a half thousand pounds per annum, Again, the taxpayer may choose to assess as follows. What would your ordinary calculation do? It picks up your gross rental, takes out your expenses, however many of those there may be, and you get your property income assessment. As we've always done in this chapter, the rental income received less the allowable expenses paid. The alternative calculation that we can use here is applying the rent a room relief, whereby Whatever was your gross rent, no deduction in relation to expenses, but we simply deduct the rent a room relief of £7,500. And that gives rise to your property income assessment. So, what have we got as rules here? If your income is less than £7,500, then that is exempt. And that rent a room relief will apply automatically. You are exempt if your gross rentals do not exceed seven and a half thousand pounds. However, if those gross rentals don't exceed seven and a half thousand, you can disapply this rule. You can say, I don't want rent a room. And why would you do that? Because maybe you've got rental income of four thousand pounds and expenses paid that year of five thousand. With rental income of 4,000, then that's exempt under the rent a room relief rules. But if you apply the normal rule, you do away with rent a room relief. Again, in this situation where expenses exceed income, I've got income of 4,000, I've got expenses of five, that would allow me to generate a loss of a thousand pounds. And even if I couldn't use that loss this year, I could use it in future years to reduce what might otherwise have been assessable property income. So that's good news. If your gross rental goes over seven and a half thousand pounds, then you, to begin with, would just revert back to the norm. Here's your ordinary calculation, as we call it there. Your gross rental, less your expenses uh, incurred there. It, it, rental income received, expenses paid. Normal calculation. However, if you wish, you can go the alternative election here for the rent a room relief to apply as a deduction against that gross rental. So rather than deducting expenses, working out a profit, you would simply be assessed on the income in excess of that seven and a half thousand pound limit. Let's see the situation in which that would be worthwhile with our little example here and the admin side. The election must be made for 2018-19, our tax year, by the 31st of January 21. In admin terms, that we may have mentioned in passing as we've gone through, but we'll, you'll see more in the admin uh, chapter, chapter 15. Basically, the tax return has to be submitted by a latest date 
the 31st of January following the end of the tax year. So for 2018-19, you've got to submit your tax return, pay your tax by the 31st of January 2020. So what they're basically saying here is you've got another year after that to make your mind up whether or not you want to revoke that uh, normal rule and adopt the rent -a room relief. So let's see what we've got here with example four. Barbara rent a room in a main residence, gross rents are £650 per month and expenses amount to £1,200 in 2018-19. Calculate Barbara's property income assessment for this year. Well, the due date, we know about that. It's up there for that tax year. Gross rents, £650 per month. Right, get your calculators out. 12 times 650 there. Does that take us over £7,500? Yes, it does. Just. 12 times 650, we'll check on the answer in a minute, but I think that's going to be £7,800. It's over seven and a half. So the normal rule would say, pick up your rental income, that's going to be 7800 We'll check that number in a moment. Less your expenses incurred, and that would be your assessment. There you can see that would be £6,600. But if you were to instead then go with this alternative calculation, you elect for it using the rent-a-room relief figure of £7,500. You take your gross rent, £7,800, and now deduct £7,500 rather than the actual expenses. So in this situation, if your actual expenses as here are lower than that rent-a-room relief of 7500 then this calculation is going to be worthwhile. Let's just have a little look at that in terms of our answer in the back. There's our ordinary calculation, rental income received, less expenses paid, there is your property income assessment. But here, and sensibly, you will make this uh, election here, the alternative calculation using rent -a room relief, same gross rental, but you simply deduct a standard 7,500 to rent a room relief. Clearly that brings you down to a £300 assessment. Well, that's rather better than £6,600. Therefore, as gross rents have exceeded 7,500, there they are. Barbara must elect for the rent a room relief to apply if she wants it. She will want this relief and then make it by the relevant due date. Now, again, most taxpayers here, like Barbara, would not be waiting around until the 31st of January 2021 to do this. They will have sorted their taxation affairs out by the 31st of January following the end of the tax year when their tax return must be submitted, their tax must be paid, and therefore they'll have made that claim by that point in time. But you're allowed up to that later point in time. If you didn't realise, you didn't know the rule, you can come back, revisit and make the election for our 1819 tax year by that date in 2021. Okay, check through what we've done so far because where we will be going uh, next in terms of our studies, still sticking with property income, but looking at something very different that we introduced at the beginning indeed of this particular chapter, what would now be a one-off premium that is received when you as a lessor grant a lease a short term at least, we'll define that again in this note next time, uh, on a property. Usually in these circumstances, there'll be a business property and you're granting what is a, in inverted commas, longer lease, but it's still a short lease. There you can see, 50 years or less, that's still a long time, but that defines a short lease there. And in this circumstance, special rules apply that are going to impact both on the assessment of that premium on the lessor and as the lessee is in business using that using commercial building within their business, what tax relief that they may be able to gain in relation to that payment made. That's what we look at and that will see us through on this chapter next time.